relatively straightforward, and the more interesting part is what comes next. We are following up with the managers of those individuals, and we're asking them to provide performance data on those fundraisers. You can probably see where this is going. We then combine those two data sets, we figure out, uh, we isolate the individuals who've been identified as high performers, and then we analyze the trends and patterns that emerge in their responses to those survey questions, in terms of you know, what they value the most, what they believe is really important for success. Um, as inspiration for our study, we actually um, are working uh, with a sister company that we have that focuses on uh, for-profit companies. And they did a study a couple of years ago on high-performing sales representatives. And what they sought to do was uh, to really dive deeply into the stereotype that Professor Breeze mentioned earlier, kind of this idea of salespeople as being the back-slapping, really charismatic individuals. Um, and they came up with a hypothesis that was actually uh, somewhat the, the, the antithesis of, of that stereotype. And up here on this slide, you'll see sort of a graphical representation of the car buying experience, um, just as a, as a lens into how the sales process has changed over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, I, I apologize, I don't have as much experience with the UK, but at least in the US, you know, if you look at 15 to 20 years ago, you walked into a car dealership armed with very little information about anything, really. You knew perhaps what your budget was, maybe you know, the color of the car that you wanted, but you know, you had to have a lot of trust in the salesperson because that person had access to uh, you know, the cost uh, of the car that they purchased from you know, the car manufacturer. They had information on safety ratings. They had all sorts of other information. If you fast forward to 2013, 2014, things look very different now, right? You can go online before you even enter the dealership, collect all types of information about what individuals in your geographical area are paying for the car. You can collect safety ratings information. Um, I actually purchased a car about a year ago, and uh, you know, car dealerships through this company, CarWoo, actually competed and bid on my, you know, on my uh, sort of. Uh, potential purchase before I even entered a car dealership. And I walked in to the car dealership with a slip of paper with the exact price on it. I didn't have to spend any time negotiating and, and the salesperson told me that was the lowest price that, that they had offered um, and in recent memory. And so I think there's been a profound shift in the sales world and we really wonder, has there been something similar that's happened in, in the fundraising world? Um, and I think that you know the, our sister company, the Corporate Executive Board, um, they, they did a fascinating study in which they surveyed about 6,000 sales representatives from across the world, uh, business to business sales, um, and they used a methodology similar to the one I described that we're using. So they uh, combined the answers to those survey questions with performance data. Uh, what's pretty interesting about their research is they used a, a, a unique statistical uh, approach called cluster analysis. So instead of simply performing typical regression uh, analysis between uh, the survey results and the performance data, they grouped together individuals on the basis of uh, their answers to different questions that had things in common uh, thematically. Um, so you'll take a look at this is what they, uh, this is what the results were of their analysis. They built out five buckets or profiles. Um, and so they have at the top uh, left the relationship builder. Um, that was an individual who's very good at cultivating relationships with customers. Um, the lone wolf, um, this was someone who you know, might be highly effective but ultimately wasn't a great team player, you know, wasn't very good at data management, um, kind of following directions. Um, and then there was the challenger, and as you can probably tell based on the name of the survey, this is, this is the one that ended up being disproportionately represented in the high performing bucket. This was someone who had a very different worldview, who wasn't afraid to push back on the customer, who generated really unique insights, um, and was able to teach the customer something unique. Uh, someone who really understood the context within which the customer was operating. And then the bottom two at the, bottom, uh, at the very bottom are the hard worker, pretty self-explanatory, and the reactive problem solver. What's interesting is that when they analyzed the distribution of those clusters within the high performing and the low performing buckets, the challenger and the lone wolf were the two that, that popped up as being disproportionately represented in the high performing bucket. Um, somewhat surprisingly, if you look at the far right side of the screen, the relationship builders were actually very poorly represented. Um, you know, there's a, a term that's used quite a bit in the US uh, to describe individuals in major gifts who are great at building relationships but not so great at the ask, uh, friend raisers. Um, somewhat pejorative, 
Um, but uh, we really wonder if there's something similar that's going on as what's represented on this slide only in the major gifts world. Um, what's particularly interesting about the study that, that our sister company did is they found that when they looked at complex transactions, uh, as sort of the subset of all uh, you know, sales situations, the challenger representative was actually even more disproportionately represented in the high performing bucket. One of our hypotheses is that major gift uh, transactions uh, are among the most complex types of transactions that can exist. We've heard so many stories from our member universities about gift agreements that are dozens and dozens of pages. You're talking about multiple parties who are involved, a very long and drawn out process in many instances. And so what really, we really wonder about is might, might something similar occur with the major gifts world uh, when we look at uh, the representation of someone like a challenger profile type um, in that area. Um, these are some of our hypotheses about what makes a top major gift officer, and I was really glad to see that there is a fair amount of alignment between what Professor Breeze was mentioning during her talk and you know, some of the hypotheses that we've developed um, in the U.S. Um, I wanted to share a couple of quick stories about some of these hypotheses. You know, unfortunately, we're in the middle of our study right now. It's concluding in, in July, uh, but I do have some you know, findings based on you know, conversations that I've had with our members that I'd love to share with you. You know, some of the ones that, that come to mind immediately are on, on, the, uh, the, uh, on, on this slide, there's somewhere on this slide that refers to flexibility, I think. Uh, uh, the flexibility in, in changing your speaking style and tone depending on the prospective donor that you're, that you're engaging. Um, you know, I had a conversation with um, a associate vice president of development at a very large private research university in the United States. And you know, he told me a story about when he was a major gift officer, he had to fly down to Florida and meet with an 85-year-old grandmother uh, and sit in an 80-degree temperature you know, condominium, uh, talking to her for two hours while drinking warm soda, right, and listening to her reminisce about the great times on campus. And then he had to immediately rush to downtown Miami to meet with a lawyer who had about literally 14 or 15 minutes with him and he had to really make the ask very quickly and get out. Um, and so that really makes me wonder about whether major gift officers who are highly successful have to have that level of flexibility. Another story that I think is really interesting, um, this is from a, a very large institution in Canada. Um, the chief advancement officer there was, was relating to me a story about how his highest performing major gift officer uh, was actually, uh, a, a, in a previous life, a bartender. Um, and so his reasoning as to why there might be a link between those two things is that the experiences that that woman had as a bartender interacting with such a diverse range of individuals, uh, building kind of a lot of, uh, a lot of, building the ability to talk to prospective donors about a wide range of issues and topics, um, that that was something that he thought led to her success in fundraising. Uh, another thing uh, that I think was really interesting is being upfront with donors. So I, I talked to a, uh, AVP of development at a very large public research university that raises hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And her highest performing uh, major gift officer um, started off every conversation with prospective donors by being very upfront and honest and telling them that she was a fundraiser, she was sitting down with that individual because eventually she would solicit him for funds, but that she wouldn't be doing so during that first conversation, and that she was much more interested in understanding what his interests were, what his, you know, uh, what his passions were. And so we've heard that a lot of prospects are very receptive to that, um, you know, not really being duplicitous or misleading in, in uh, engaging them uh, at the very outset. Um, the last story I wanted to share um, that I think is uh, really interesting is, is really just a quote that I heard from a, a liberal arts college uh, associate vice president who mentioned to me that she thought that the, the highest performing fundraisers in her shop were chameleons who have souls. Right? <laughs> so I'll end on that. Um, I know we don't have a, a ton of time. I think we have a couple of minutes. All right. Does anyone have any, any questions? <laughs>